Mm -hmm. Okay, we are good to go. All right, very good here. Let me uh, let me pull up the agenda here. I apologize for being okay, a little disorganized here. Right now. All right. Um, are we going to wait for the mayor? He's coming on right this second. Okay. I won't make any jokes about being an 06. <laughs> Sorry about that. I uh, had 06 technical keep, uh, problem. <laughs> Yeah. Apparently they get worse as you go up. All you got to do is call a staff sergeant and he'll fix it. I, if I had one, if I had one. <laughs> All right, everything should be good to go. Hey, Brett, you want to call a meeting to order or do you want me to do that? Um, I can go ahead and call the order, uh, meeting to order. So let's call this meeting the or order. It is the 3rd of May. This is going to be a Lake Seaman City Council workshop tonight. Um, there will be no citizens comments. This is a workshop uh, within the city council. Um, the agenda is online and um, <clears throat> uh, this will be posted. This, uh, uh, this workshop is completely via Zoom and will later be posted on our YouTube channel on uh, Lake Stevens YouTube. So with that, I will turn the meeting over to Council President um, Ewing. Thank you. Um... So we'll have a, a briefing uh, by uh, Dave Levitan and Jill Needham. I'm not sure which one's going to lead out on that. Um, but uh, if you guys can go ahead and do a brief presentation, and then we'll uh, have some council comments and discussion. Great. Hey, I'm going to go ahead and lead the discussion and just have a really short PowerPoint. Um, All right. Uh, thank you, Council. Uh, so Dave Levitan, Planning Manager, and also have Jill Needham here, as well as Russ, who have all worked uh, very closely on this. Uh, so this is a proposed code amendment uh, to what is currently called uh, tourist homes in the city. It's in um, the Municipal Code, Section 1444064. Um, tourist home is a bit of an antiquated term. It's more commonly known as short-term rentals now, it, which encompasses a larger segment of the short-term rental um, kind of market. Um, so we adopted these existing regulations way back in 1998. They have not been touched since. Um, a couple of the highlights of the exist existing code include a requirement for owner occupancy, a limitation on 10 consecutive days and 30 total days in a calendar year, um, a requirement for a type two land use application, uh, which is an administrative conditional use permit. Um, and kind of you factor in all of those things and we only have one that's currently licensed in the city. Um, so when we started taking a look at this and proposed it as part of the long range work program, um, really wanted to modernize and simplify the code, um, streamline the review process, get rid of that type two land use process if possible. Um, and at the same time, acknowledge community concerns as far as having, um, you know, a, a use, uh, within a primarily residential area that is kind of more limited in duration um, and address any potential impacts that, uh, you know, we identify or are, or are identified by the community. So a little bit over the, a little bit about the review process to date. Um, so this was brought before the Planning Commission for an initial work session in December of 2021. Uh, there was subsequently work sessions in February, early February, and then on March 16th. Uh, March 16th is when we provided the first draft of the proposed code amendment um, to the Planning Commission. Um, they generally thought that it was very well written. They, they um, had a couple of very great points, a couple of great suggestions that were then incorporated into the draft that was shared at the public hearing on April 20th. Um, we also received uh, four public comments in late February and early March. Um, which were primarily focused on a desire to maintain the owner occupancy requirement 
uh, ba basically to not allow unhosted rentals where somebody can own a property and not live there and just rent it out full time as an Airbnb or VRBO or whatever term you use for short term rentals. Um, so that was kind of the, the general tone and tenor of the public comments that we received in advance of the March 16th work session. And then that was also generally the type of public comments that we, we received at the public hearing for the Planning Commission, which was on April 20th. Uh, generally, again, people were pretty comfortable with the code that testified at that meeting. Um, there was some discussion among the commissioners about getting rid of the owner occupancy requirement and the general feedback uh, during the public comment period was that people at least the ones that testified wanted to maintain that owner occupancy requirement. Uh, so at that April 20th public hearing, the Planning Commission, after listening to public comment and deliberating, did vote five to one to recommend approval of the code amendment as shown in attachment one. Um, and the City Council is currently scheduled to hold a public hearing on May 10th to consider that recommendation. And this workshop is obviously to uh, discuss it with the city council in advance of that public hearing and to get any feedback uh, prior to that public hearing. Uh, so some of the specific guidance that uh, had been provided by the planning commission between March and the April 20th public hearing was um, maintaining that owner occupancy requirements, uh, making sure that the code clarifies that these are permitted within accessory dwelling units that have been gone through the required approval process. Um, try to be as clear and objective as possible and provide a little bit more clarity on the code enforcement process. Um, originally, we had proposed uh, that there would be a requirement um, as part of the application that the applicant provide notice to the uh, immediately adjacent properties and then provide proof that they had sent out that notice. Um, Planning Commission requested that that be expanded to a radius of 300 feet of the property, which would match um, our type two and type three requirements as far as the radius from the property of public notice being provided. Um, and then there was also kind of one of the main concerns from the planning commission was impacts on parking, making sure that there was adequate parking as well, including the potential for boat trailers, um, especially for lakefront properties, just that there might be an impact from that. Uh, so all of that feedback from the Planning Commission was incorporated into the code amendment that's shown in attachment one. Um, some of the highlights of that code include maintaining that owner occupancy requirement, eliminating the maximum days allowed, um, limiting rentals to two separate parties and eight total individuals uh, with no more than six in one individual party. So if you had, an, uh, if you had a family of six that uh, did a short-term rental, then there could only be another party of two at the same time uh, during any concurrent period. Um, proposing to get rid of that type two ad administrative conditional use as far as the, the process for getting approval, it would go through a business license, um, kind of a short-term rental application addendum, and then also a health and safety inspection between the building official and the fire marshal um, to make sure that there are things like legal egress, um, things that basically all other building and fire code issues that would kind of be pertinent to this type of use um, are adhered to. Um, it does require that notice to be provided to properties within 300 feet of a 300 foot radius of the property boundaries. Um, and then also requires one parking space per rented bedroom. And that's in addition to the two spaces that are required for a say a detached single family residence. So you would be required to provide your basic parking for the primary use and then also an additional space for each bedroom that you want to rent out um, as a short term rental. So with that, um, we are looking for some feedback from the Council tonight before we move it on to the public hearing if the desire is still to have that on the 10th. Um, looking for um, any proposed changes to the draft code language. Um, we've also had discussions been having discussions with the building official um, and we're proposing that that initial application fee be $150 to cover the cost of the review and the inspection um, basically to get the building official and, and um, need to consult with the fire district as far as any fees that they would need to have 
and then also currently discussing outreach and education strategy, including a pathway for existing non-conforming short-term rentals to come into compliance. Um, if you take a look at Airbnb or VRBO or any of these other sites, there are a number that are currently operating and they do not have licenses. So we're trying to come up with a good strategy of not only permitting new ones, but also bringing into compliance existing ones. Um, and so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions and Jill and Russ are also here. Uh, Angie, looks like, uh, go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, Dan. That was a great presentation. I have a couple of questions. I just want to make sure I'm understanding some of the language. So owner occupied, does that mean that when the guests are staying, the owner also has to be residing in on the in the facility in the house. So the owner occupancy means that it needs to be their primary residence of the owner. They then, during any particular stay, they can have basically a designee, a property manager. We just we don't want to have like a completely absentee property owner. We want this to be their primary residence, but say they're on vacation and they want to be able to rent it out, they need to have somebody there at the home, um, a property manager, um, their basically designated representative, their agent, um, just so that there is an on-site presence. That was a major concern of the community and also of the planning commission that they, if it was unhosted, there were some discussions about, you know, could we have it so that there could be an off-site property manager within five miles or 10 miles and the general direction from the planning commission is they wanted to have that on-site presence either from the property owner or from a designee. So there has to be someone staying there at the same time the the place is being rented? Correct. Okay. And then um, I'm curious the the rule around there being a maximum of six in one party where like what the thought is around that. I'm just thinking of, you know, if there's a couple that has five kids and they, they're wanting to vacation here, they wouldn't be allowed. Is that accurate? I think that was just factoring in that we were allowing up to two. I mean, we could get rid of that six potentially and just have it be a maximum of eight. And whether if that was one party or two, that would be an, an option. Um, there wasn't, um, Jill can step in, but I don't think there was any particular reason for the maximum of six in one party. Okay. Using that same example, couple with five kids under the age of 18 and the parking space requirement, if let's say it's a three bedroom house, would that mean that, that they would be required to be five parking spaces at that site, even though it's a large family that just has one car? Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Uh, so if it was, if they were renting out three bedrooms, mm -hmm. like a four bedroom house and the yeah. main house had to have to yeah, that that's the way that the code currently reads yes is it's based on the 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 bedroom count as far as being utilized as a short-term rental okay um, i i think my my concern is that we don't have a hotel here in lake stevens i think we want to encourage families to come to our community and if if they're all if there's you know a couple and four kids in one car but they can't rent this particular place because they don't because it doesn't have or there isn't a rental available because it doesn't have four parking spaces. That seems just, I don't know, prohibitive and doesn't allow us to, you know, encourage people, I guess, to our community. So some, just something to think about. Um, and then you had said that there, there's going to be a campaign to um, help current Airbnb or VRBO renters who are who are not complying with these um, this new code to help them come into compliance. So, so what I'm understanding or what that means to me is they're not going to be grandfathered in. They they will need to follow this code, and there'll be a process to help them do that. Yeah, so they wouldn't be grandfathered in because they don't have. Ex I'm talking about the ones specifically that don't have existing licenses. Um, mm -hmm. So they're basically non-compliant with the existing code. We do have the existing code since 1998. Um, it is a bit onerous, which was the impetus for this project. Um, but yeah, they would. We're basically discussing, you know, basically an outreach campaign, kind of getting the word out, doing flyers, things like that, to try. 
um, to encourage people to come into compliance now that there has been this code amendment. And we think that it is a little bit more flexible. It doesn't have the cap on, you know, 10 slash 30 days maximum for the year, which I can understand. You probably wouldn't want to get licensed and go through a type two if it was just for 30 days. Sure. Um, so yeah, that, that was the thought on that. And so, um, yeah, we would welcome any feedback as far as kind of how to approach that. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. I was surprised when I did a, just a really quick search um, yesterday, how many there are available in Lake Stevens. And so um, it seems like that's a, that could be a whole other project. So um, thank you for the clarification. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Andy, do you have any more questions? Okay. Um, excellent. Thank you, Gary. Yes, thank you. Um, one thing I would ask is the uh, council to consider is, and I think Councilmember Jorstad mentioned, this is essentially a mini hotel that's being allowed. And so currently the city doesn't have a lodging tax. <clears throat> um, and I would urge the council to consider imposing one for the very reason of the impacts upon city services uh, that will be encountered. You may have a situation where folks come in, they don't go to the restaurants, they don't utilize any services here, they just come in uh, and hang out. And I'm guessing probably on the lake front, uh, bringing their own food, things of that sort. So yet the impact upon city services is still there on our roads, parks, uh, services in general. So I would hope that we would look at uh, a lodging tax of some sort so that the city can be mitigated, I guess, for the impacts on, on, um, on its services. The other issue would be um, on page five, it talks about section B number seven. It says the premises may be subject to safety and compliance inspections as part of the annual business license renewal. And I would request that that language be changed to the premises will be subject to safety and compliance inspections. The elevated, uh, you have guests in, in a particular home and it seems to me that the risk is a little bit elevated there rather than just having relatives visit your home. Uh, so I would think that the city would wanna be diligent and require that we do have safety inspections as far as the annual business license renewal. The only other thing I would say is that I have observed the planning commission as being the liaison for the council and the planning commission. And um, I think they were very thorough in their deliberations and uh, took their time. And I think for the most part did this right. Um, so I applaud them and um, give them kudos for doing that work. The only other item I would request that um, we have, it was noted there was four or five letters that were received uh, in comment to the, the proposal here. And yet in our packet, there's only one little letter that's uh, attached here in indicating they're just unable to attend the Zoom or the meeting of last two weeks ago. So. I would uh, ask that the other letters be attached so that the other council members get a flavor as to what people deal with. Um, primarily the VRBOs are on the lakefront and uh, I would guess probably 90% of them are. And um, those are the folks that are being impacted the most. So uh, um, hopefully with those letters, you'll kind of empathize with uh, some of the issues that take place uh, when people um, rent uh, spaces on the lakefront. So with that, thank you. And again, I think the Planning Commission did a great job. Um, again, I would ask that the council consider a lodging tax uh, prior to implementing this, this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, Angie, if you don't mind, can I get a follow-up to your input that you had? Um, 
so one of your questions was on the number of residents um, or people staying. Um, did you have something in mind? Because um, I, I appreciate you use the example of people with five children. I think that's a great number that you chose. Um, and um, so I'm just wondering if you had a number in mind or if there was a better way that you had in mind to quantify the number of people that you would like to see allowed at a residence. I mean, I, I appreciated Dan's answer that, that maybe the, the, you know, one party of six and one party of two, that there doesn't need to be a limit on six, um, but that the eight person limit in total might make more sense. Um, I, I guess, you know, and, and, and what if there's a couple of seven kids, right? I mean, I, I hate to, um, I hate to be too restrictive. And I also very much understand that we don't want to, you know, we don't want 20 people renting a house anywhere, whether it's on the lake or, you know, anywhere else and having giant parties. And, I, you know, I, I get that there needs to be a number. I just want to be thoughtful that we're not excluding families from visiting Lake Stevens and that being the only option about, you know, how to stay here. Thank you. Um, Sean? Thank you, um, President Ewing, and thank you, David, for your um, thank you for your presentation. Um, you know, I, I have a couple of questions, and and frankly, a concern. Uh, I'm concerned anytime we start to legislate what people do with their own property. Um, you know that that was certainly a conversation in other areas when we talked about things like signs, um, and and this is certainly a much more significant conversation. I'd be curious to know what sort of data was provided uh, that actually demonstrated real impacts uh, as opposed to hypotheticals in, in making this determination. Um, also, I'd be curious to know if we have any, any, um, any indications that this creates a safety uh, issue uh, for our residents. Have there been any, uh, can we point to any significant data in terms of police reports or call outs? Uh, for either uh, noise or activity complaints that aren't all that aren't compliant with our existing codes. Uh, just really, just really sort of understanding, you know, in the interest of being diligent here, are we, are we legislating to a problem or what are we legislating to? Um, so I, I would welcome any feedback in those areas. Sure. I'm happy to field this one to start with. So with our, our conversation with the Planning Commission, we, we definitely talked about some of those issues and some of the people who've testified that have been directly affected um, testified to those issues of police calls, et cetera. Some of them have been um, afraid to report these, um, you know, again, without sort of the owners. And the other thing we did is we looked at some literature review of other communities that have done this. And um, in particular, we provided sort of a, a best um, practices document to the planning commission to go through that had had some national analysis of many communities that have implemented these. And they came up with sort of what they believe were the, the best recommendations to include in your ordinance. And again, as we go through this ordinance, um, property rights are the one of the key things we're looking at, that there's two sides to the property rights. There's the property right enjoyment of your property right and not have your neighborhood be flooded with additional cars, noise, et cetera. And then the property right of how can you use your own um, residence for, for profit um, or how, as you see fit. So I think that was the balance that we tried to present to the planning commission with some resources outside of staff's opinions, but some, you know, again, some literature research, national <clears throat> literature research, so they could um, do that independent research, gave them a flavor of codes from many communities, and then tried to craft something that made sense here. And that's where we landed on the, the owner occupancy or the hosted environment again, just so there is a responsible person not trying to limit someone's ability to use their home, but there's a responsible person in the home that takes away from the police calls, et cetera. And the, the safety part, we can break that into you know, a couple of examples and we can 
try and find actual data of real police calls, but then the annual safety inspections that we're talking about, those are the general things you would see in any type of a commercial environment that there's exit signs, the ingress egress path is clearly marked. It has appropriate sanitation, um, potentially the restrooms are ADA compliant. So those are the other types of you know, things that we would be concerned with. Again, if those are, are the only lodging options in the city currently that they are safe for the, the users. Thank you. Um, quick follow-up question in that regard. So I, I don't generally think of ADA compliance in, in terms of, of the, the, the average residential house. So would anyone doing this, uh, would anybody engaged in this activity have to make sure that their house was ADA compliant, uh, i.e. ramps to get into the house if, if the main floor was elevated, uh, that sort of thing? Is that what we're saying? Primarily what we were looking at, and I shouldn't have used ADA as the example, it's more the, the fire safety and the ingress and egress, but I will double check now with the building official before we come back to you if there would need to be ramps or widened doorways. Well, it's it's an interesting point, um, you know, because I, I, I think that if that's, if, if that is, if that actually is a requirement, uh, I think that's something that isn't necessarily called out in the proposed ordinance that would, that would certainly need to be because it has a significant impact uh, when you start talking about the width of doorways and, and all of those things uh, in terms of ADA compliance. So uh, definitely an interesting point. Um, I, I certainly, I, I certainly, um, agree with, with some of the points that uh, council member Peter Shagan made, uh, you know, we, we need to make sure that if there are impacts uh, that there is a process to um, essentially mitigate those impacts. Uh, the, these are primarily business activities that need to be balanced with the uh, ownership, uh, the property rights of those individuals engaged in those activities. And as you pointed out, against the property rights of everyone surrounding them. So I uh, definitely just want to fully understand what we're putting in this rule and why and, and making sure that all those things that are necessary are included um, if and when this eventually moves forward. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Tadget. Yes. Uh, so I just wanted to, I've been chatting with several people who have um, properties. Um, I feel like, I feel like we are infringing quite a bit on people's ownership rights of their homes, uh, personally. Um, I understand that people rent their house on the lake. I personally don't rent my house out on the lake, but I know a lot of people who do rent their homes out. And I feel like associations have a lot of requirements within a homeowners association that prevent this in the first place. But then you have people who purchased their home and maybe have bought a second home in our VR billing, the other one to help pay the bills. And sometimes they can be in a tight situation. So I feel like putting a ownership requirement uh, that they have to occupy the house, I think that's unfair to people who have used property as investments. Um, I, I feel like the, I understand the health and safety point of it. Uh, I, I like the idea of a hotel tax. We just don't have any other options for people to come and short-term stay here in Lake Stevens. And I feel like we're really, a lot of these things are like having a, someone has to be in the home while they're doing it or five mile radius or whatever you might want to put on. I feel like that's a stretch of someone's personal right. I feel like making someone go and tell everyone with 300 feet that they're going to use their home as a rental I don't know why that requirement would be there to make sure all the neighbors know that the home could be vacant, which offers safety problems. Because what if they are renting out as a VRBO and it's vacant? That lets everyone know that the home's vacant quite a bit. So I just think we're really reaching on this. I hope that at the next uh, opportunity for people to come and comment, we can vet through a lot of these things. But I, I feel like we're going very much over people's personal rights to do what they want with the home that they have and the investments they have. 
and I don't want to see it uh, cause problems for our police and everything. I think a lot of times it goes very unnoticed. I just think we're, like Sean kind of mentioned, legislating ourselves into a lot of problems and which could financially hurt people as well. So I just, I hope we can look at these other things that we're asking for and the requirements can be overburdening. It looks like we're doing that here, in my opinion. Thank you. Um, uh, Councilmember Dickinson. You can unmute yourself. All right, got it. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say, and I appreciate what Councilmember Tajan just said because that's eye-opening for me. I would love to hear more from the community. Have there been community concerns? Uh, and the other thing I would say that lodging tax kind of surprised me, but the truth is, if we are going to ask our hardworking city staff to go out and assess houses and see whether they're doing everything they're supposed to do, that takes time and that's a lot of work. And it needs to happen, but at the same time, it is a load of a burden on our city staff. But I would like to uh, continue this conversation. Um, it's very eye-opening for me. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, David, for your presentation also. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mayor? Yeah, if the council would indulge me a few comments on this one as a, uh, David, is it possible to geographically separate the, the rules on this? I, Here's, I fully understand the concerns of those who live on the lake with a VRBO or Airbnb sitting right next to them and a weekend party every single weekend. I absolutely get that side of it. Um, as someone who, who, when I travel with my family, I always Airbnb because I don't want to be in a hotel with my precious little small children who wake up in the middle of the night and see me and want to jump in bed, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, in my trip last week to Idaho, I did an Airbnb of a house um, in the vicinity that we needed to be because it's more conducive and more comfortable to my family. So <clears throat> when I look at Lake Stevens, I'm looking at the Airbnb list right now, and there's, there's 28 places on the map. Um, I didn't even realize it. The house across the street and two down from me is an Airbnb. I didn't even know that. Um, and, um, and then I see that there's, of those 27, 28 houses, nine of them are on the lake, but this code is really meant for houses on the lake. And it's not opening that opportunity for um, people in essentially a different market, right? For, uh, for the ability to come into Lake Stevens to be there for the funeral, to be there for the, to see the family, whatever it might be, and not have to stay in a hotel. Uh, for an example, um, one of these is a condo up there at Fair, Fairweather Point. You're not going to have someone living, you're not going to have the owner of that condo living with you while you're there, right? I can understand if it's a, if it's a, a lake house and you've got a little mother-in-law up to the side or in the basement and the owner wants to jump on the couch in the bottom of that while people are partying upstairs, more power to you, but, but this is completely restricting the entire city's capabilities to do this sort of uh, property ownership rights sorts of things. And I, I've got a lot of concerns with it. Um, so Brett, can I follow up on that? So what you've kind of told us what you don't like, is there something that you do like that you would want to keep? Um, I, I get Gary's point about a lodging tax, you know, if you've got the, the group who's coming in to, um, say a lake house, they're going to bring all their own food in. They're going to, they're going to already have their boat filled and they're not really going to leave a lot behind other than a mess. Right. So I get the lodging tax side of things. I, I can understand that. Um, I'm really concerned about, um, um, inspecting these things yearly, especially for safety. Um, I, I, I don't know that, I'd love to see another city that does that. Um, I'm not sure that that happens. 
Um, I just, I did, this is a very onerous um, requirement, I think, upon this industry. Um, thank you. So can I just add, um, so I think the, um, a bigger concern if you talk to lakefront owners is you get um, people in their boats that are drunk, playing loud music, cat calling to the people on their properties. I know people in several locations on the lake and they can't go out and recreate in their own property because the people sit in their boats and they just anchor blasting rock music and loud music, whatever it is. Um, and they're just drunk off their behinds and there's, um, there's no enforcement. Yeah. Um, and that's the biggest complaint that I hear and, um, of that. And so, um, Airbnb has their own policing system. You look on there, you can report if someone is, is abusing their Airbnb, Airbnb polices their own people. Um, so if someone, if your neighbor has got an Airbnb and they're not maintaining, they're not following the guidelines that are there, um, they can revoke their ability to host an Airbnb. Um, so there's some policing that's already in there. Sorry, I, I, haven't, I haven't raised my hand yet. So I better go back to, um, Brett, are you done? Yeah, I'm, I'm done. And, and I, well, I hear you on that, Steve, that there is the capability within Airbnb for a neighbor to complain on a neighbor. Um, my personally, and, and what you're describing as far as the lake, I mean, that, that, hap that happens with visitors, that happens with people who live on the lake, do all that, those same things, unfortunately, and it's just difficult to enforce. But uh, yeah, I'm done. It is. All right. Uh, Councilman Frederick. Yeah, I... I, uh, you know, the first thing I would ask uh, very simply, if we have a requirement in, in Lake Stevens code for property owners to occupy their residences to begin with, um, we have people that own property here that don't necessarily spend a large amount of time in their residence because they work elsewhere. They spend significant amounts of time traveling. And to an earlier point, that's really where you have a high potential for a property to be utilized uh, for uh, inappropriate activities when you have these properties that aren't being occupied. Um, so that'd be my first question. The second thing is really just to comment on something that you said, uh, Council, uh, or actually, um, I, I don't know who said it at this point, but in, in regards to, you know, people being loud and drunk in operating motor vehicles, those really aren't rental property issues. Those are legal issues related to uh, already existing noise ordinances and ordinances around unsafe operations uh, of motor vehicles under the influence. So uh, again, uh, you know, I just, I, I think we need to be careful about what we are attempting to legislate um, and, and making sure that we are doing things that are actually of use and not being duplicative. Uh, cer certainly uh, a quick call to Chief Bazizo's staff would help mitigate some of those drunk boaters uh, on, the, on the lake pretty quickly. I'm, I'm confident in our police force. They, they, they would manage that. So um, Sean, if I can follow up your question there. So am I hearing you say that um, some of the what is in the our proposed short-term rental code we already have redundancy in our existing city code with regard to noise ordinance quiet time um, parking requirements um, things of that nature yeah these these things already exist so I, I don't know why we would recreate them in another rule and fireworks <laughs> yeah yeah let's we're not talking about fireworks <laughs> um yeah, Councilmember Dorstad. Thank you. I'll be quick because I've already spoken. I really appreciate everyone's comments. It's um, so it's great to hear all the different perspectives. I um, I do wonder if maybe we want to look at doing this in phases. Maybe the first step really is to um, have kind of redefine what what short term rentals are. Have there be a, a license or a, a permit or something that people have to purchase so that and, and doing that outreach so that we know what we're looking at. Do we have five houses? Do we have 50 houses? How many properties do we have in Lake Stevens? Um, and then look at potentially a lodging tax. I think you know that makes sense in terms of mitigating some of those impacts on our city. But then then we'll have a, sort of an inventory of, of what we're looking at and, and a better way to determine what the problems are. 
because I do, th- I do think we're imposing some pretty heavy handed mm-hmm. rules on things that we don't really know are problems or not problems. Um, so maybe we start, you know, kind of start with phase one and, and see where that takes us. I'm not super um, supportive of dividing, you know, whether it's like lake houses versus non-lake houses. I think that becomes really nitpicky. And well, what if, you know, this house has a peekaboo, peekaboo view of the lake? Is that considered a lake house? You know, I just, I think it gets too nitpicky. I'd like to just treat our city as one city around the lake with one set of rules for this particular issue. And I would propose that we um, start with the basics and then see where that takes us. So if I could just throw my two cents in there, Angie, awesome comments. Um, so I, I think what this, this code is, and correct me if I'm wrong, and it seems curious that it's been, hasn't been updated in 24 years. And now we have a handful of people, we don't really have data that suggests that, hey, it's a certain area where we have calls and the chief, if you can correct, correct us if we're wrong, if there is a, a number of places where you're getting multiple calls for this. But um, if we don't have data to support what we're doing, it seems like someone's got the ear of you know someone at City Hall and calling saying, hey, I don't like this, this is a problem. And that's why this is being generated, um, this whole conversation. So uh, I could totally be wrong on that, but that, that seems to be the appearance with it being uh, taken 24 years and now it's being updated. Um, Marcus, you had your hand up. Uh, here's what I'll say is I think there's a lot of people who, you know, when you talk about people on the lake being drunk or whatever or, and boating and doing inappropriate things, our docks are packed all summer long. People, there's a line to get on the lake. So you got a lot of people who are just coming to the lake from Everett, Snohomish, Marysville. I don't know there's necessarily a bunch of Airbnb beers who are causing all this problem. I'm sure there's been a problem once or twice on the lake with other people, right? I, I get it. Um, but I just think we're adding a lot of stuff on these Airbnb beers, which I think Brett, I would say that most of the time I've Airbnb, I'm usually going to local restaurants. I usually go to the grocery store, buy some groceries for the week. You know, and if somebody wants to Airbnb their house out for a month to somebody, I don't know why we would put rules around that for them that they can only have it so many days out of the month or so many days out of the year to, we don't know what really a problem is here. I, I don't see as many problems. And I've talked to several Airbnb this uh, week who have kind of reached out and said, yeah, I just don't understand why you guys are going so heavy handed with this. So that's, that's my two cents. I just, I don't know that there's as much problem around this. I do like the idea of uh, uh, some kind of hotel tax uh, as well. I mean, I'm, I'm good for that, but I think having inspections on these people all the time if someone doesn't like the home, they're going to put one star down and no one's going to rent that house. So I just, and I think a lot of communities have CCNRs and bylaws and rules and regulations about this. So I don't know that we can just, I don't think there's a real concern that every neighborhood is going to be packed full of Airbnbs in Lake Stevens. We're a pretty family oriented community, but a lot of the CCNRs take care of these issues of whether people can and cannot have uh, Airbnb. So that's part of it there as well. So just throwing that out. Hey, I appreciate the comment. So Marcus, I apologize if I gave the opinion that um, I thought those were Airbnbers that were behaving um, in that way. Um, that was not my intention to communicate that. Um, I, my point was to say that there's people that are impacted independent <clears throat> of the Airbnb by the behavior of others on the lake. Sure. Um, so um, any other comments or discussion? So um it looks like we have some items that we want. Um, uh, David, do you want to rehash for us kind of the, the summary of the comments that um, council has shared? And um, and then I guess we can make sure that we're understanding what, what we shared and then go from there. Yeah, I mean, I've written down most of them. So there was concerns about the maximum number, especially in any one party limiting that at six. Uh, there were questions about even if you got rid of that limit of six and say made it eight, there might still be some current concerns that we have any sort of artificial cap. Um, would like to get maybe a little bit more guidance if there is just a desire from council not to have a maximum number or to have it at a specific number and just not limit it by individual party. Um, so that was one. Um, concerns about the 
requiring one parking space per bedroom and how that might impact families with a lot of kids. If you're say renting out four bedrooms in a, in a house and now that house has to provide six off street parking spaces, um, two for the primary use and four for the rented out bedrooms. Um, there were questions about bringing into compliance and what that process would look like. Um, there was general consensus about support for a lodging tax. Um, and uh, there was some, there were kind of mixed opinions on the uh, inspections. Um, Council member Peter Sagan um, was in support of kind of requiring that to be on an annual basis. There were others that kind of questioned uh, the need for that maybe beyond the initial inspection and requiring that on an annual basis. Um, general concerns about legislating property rights from a number of different um, council members, questions about ADA compliance, whether that would be required as part of the life and safety inspection and general building code and fire code compliance. Um, and if it were needed, we would need to make sure to include that in the ordinance. Um, uh, there were some kind of that seemed opposed to the, at least a couple uh, council members and the mayor that seemed opposed to the owner occupancy requirements, um, as well as the 300 foot requirement, which are two of kind of the integral components of the code. So we definitely want a little bit more feedback and discussion from the council on that. Um, just as a reminder, this is currently scheduled for a public hearing for next week. So we would like some direction if um, if we'd like to open that public hearing and have that get the initial public feedback, um, potentially continue it to do some additional analysis or kind of um, do some discussion of the initial deliberation that's provided by the council. So that's something up from staff side that we'd like some direction from council on. Um, let's see already touched on the owner occupancy requirement, the yearly inspection, um, and then just a kind of general thought process that some a number of these items are being internally placed by Airbnb or VRBO or some of these other businesses that are, um, you know, kind of the major players in the short-term rental market and looking at items that potentially could be removed from the code if they're already either redundant in other sections of city code or something that the private market could take care of on their own. Um, if anybody has anything beyond that, I'm happy to make sure that we consider that. Thank you, Dave, for that summary. So one other thing I, I failed to mention, if I'm a bad guest um, and I'm reported, um, so let's say I, I do an Airbnb and I agree with uh, Brett and some other people and Marcus, I mean, I prefer Airbnbs to hotels. Um, if I'm a bad guest, um, and I'm reported as a bad guest, I can be suspended or banned um, from ever using Airbnb. So um, there's there's incentive for people, not just that one specific location, but Airbnb or, you know, and you can set up additional profile and change it, but that's kind of a pain. Um, but that is something um, that's there. I My take is I think there's enough changes that we are looking at as a council and things that we have concerns with that I think we need another, um, and council, please chime in and share your thoughts, that we need um, kind of a rehash of this code or this um, ordinance um, and bring it back for another workshop before we present it for a public hearing. Because right now I think we're, there's too many things that I think that would not pass um, by the council. And there'd be too many amendments um, that this went, um, for a discussion item for a vote, there'd be way too many amendments to be an effective ordinance. Council, your thoughts? My only um, thought would be, would it make sense to go forward with a public hearing to capture that feedback along with our feedback tonight to and use that to um, kind of go back to the drawing board? Are there things, maybe there are things that we haven't thought of that the public would bring up that would be useful in recrafting um, the ordinance, so. My two cents. Others? Mary? Yeah, I have to agree. And that was my thinking too. Uh, let's let the people speak to this. Um, and it would be really helpful to me. It's really more complicated than I even dreamed it, but it could be helpful to hear from the people of Lake Stevens. Those that live on the lake, those that don't live on the lake, those that have an Airbnb or whatever their experience is that they have here in Lake Stevens, it would really help. Thank you. Okay, um, Kim. 
So I'm curious, did anybody comment at the uh, planning commission that had a BRB or was this just people complaining about BRBs? Just folks who had had issues with BRBs um, near their residences. So no BRB owners no. said anything. Did we, it was there. Uh, that seems a little bit lopsided to me. Did we reach out to the people that we have on the list to get their input um, and let them know that this was being uh, considered or was there any outreach on the city's part to these folks? I believe, well, is, yeah, go ahead, Russ. I believe that was going to be the notifications before the, the council's public hearing um, to start presenting those options, but no, there had not been before planning commission. So another part of my uh, concerns is, I, uh, Brett, you brought up the case of you know, we could make it a little different geographically. That's not really, uh, I don't even think that's legal for us to do in any kind of legislation in a, in a city. Uh, we have to treat everybody equally. Uh, and, you know, uh, that would be just, I, I couldn't fathom doing that. So that would be a problem for me. Um, the, a couple of specific things that I'd have a problem with is uh, trying to put commercial uh, codes on a residential pr uh, property, such as exit signs and things like that. That's just flipping ridiculous. There's a door to get out and there's a window to get out. You don't need signs to point that out in a residential building. Um, so there's, you know, there's a few things like that. ADA requirements, you're not going to have anybody be able to do that. It's just your houses are not built that way right? unless they're built to begin with. You don't, you don't have, you're not going to re rip out all your cabinets, put in ADA, ADA cabinets and, and all that kind of stuff. I happen to do ADA once in a while and it's not, it's not as easy as that. So we're just once again, putting something in there that basically says, yeah, we're not allowing BRBs in our city. Because uh, that's what this sounds like to me. So we're just not going to allow BRBs in our city. We're going to make it too hard. So, Kim, are you supportive of a um, public hearing next week um, to get feedback? Well, I, I don't mind having a public hearing, but I sure like to have it balanced instead of just everybody that wants to complain about it. Which you know, how many? How many is that? Yeah. If we don't okay. have any BRB people coming in to talk to us about this, then we're then we're not, you know, we're not being. Uh, thoughtful enough in what we're doing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilman Frederick. Yeah, you were looking for feedback on whether or not uh, there was support for, um, you know, public, you know, uh, public hearing there is. I just wonder as a matter of process, is that consistent with how we generally move these items forward? Um, is the public hearing more once we've decided that this is what we're proposing is an action that we have uh, public hearing on that uh, would be uh, my general question. Is it just as a matter of, of practice and process, um, and Greg can certainly weigh in if there is a, a legal component to that uh, as far as which order those things have to happen. I, I suspect that there isn't, um, but certainly need yeah. to get certainly need to have have a public comment and, and to council member daughtry's uh um previous comments there, there really needs to be balanced comment we need to hear from all sides on this um and again it speaks to the the initial concern of respecting all property owners rights we we need we need to hear all pro we need to hear from both sides of this uh issue to make a fair decision really up to you uh, your, in terms of your process, uh, in fact, you can have multiple public hearings. You could do one now and get your organi your uh, <clears throat> uh, ordinance together, and then before it gets finalized, have a second public hearing uh, when you know more what you think you're going to do. So it's really up to you. The more public comment, the better. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Can I just follow up on, uh, Sean, I, I really appreciate that point. So my concern is that we present something like we have now that's so in rough form that I think we risk creating confusion with the public. We have put it forth all these ideas that we, sounds like we're not going to move forward with on a handful of items that are just going to be stricken. So why would we present that as a, you know, as an ordinance um, when those things are going to be stricken and then um, create some confusion? 
Um, or maybe, maybe we change our mind because we hear different things on it. I don't know. Um, Council, uh, Councilmember Peter Shagan. I would love to hear public comment on this issue. It's, um, I think, Councilmember Ewing, if you may recall, part of the reason, and Director Wright can speak to this a little bit better, but part of the reason why this issue has come up is to kind of get out in front of the issue before it does become a problem. There's been a number of folks at the Planning Commission level that spoke in regards to uh, trying to get the issue getting arms around the issue before it does become a problem. And then you have that reactionary type situation. So um, that's part of the reason why this is coming up here. Um, I've heard from probably four or five different individuals on the lakefront that have had extreme problems uh, with their neighbors <laughs> uh, and not, not neighbors that occupy the residents on a permanent basis, but the, the uh, folks that um, spend the weekend there and you know that they didn't live there. Additionally, I've also heard from folks that um, were concerned about essentially being trapped in this, in the sense of, uh, owning a home and having VRBOs on both sides of them. And um, so I, you know, I think there, there's valid concerns on both sides of the table. I would like to hear from the public um, and then maybe we do craft something a little bit different, but um, I think it would be warranted this time to hear from the public, the concerns that are out there. It sounds like we have a significant, um, at least five council members that are um, supportive of that. So um, that, that sounds, uh, David, I guess, sounds like we'll, we'll proceed with the, uh, with the public hearing next week um, and, uh, and then go from there. Director Wright, did you have something you wanted to share? Your hand's still up. I, I did. Thank you, um, Council President Ewing. I was just going to suggest from a procedural standpoint, if the council ultimately does think that they're going to have some significant changes, um, staff obviously doesn't have um, the chance to provide any of those before the hearing packet would be due. So I would almost recommend we push it out. We could come back at a public hearing with the current draft, but also a, an alternate draft that incorporates some of the, the council's comments and then sort of hear um, with some alternate views of that. But again, if it's the, the council's desire just to hear feedback on the ordinance as it's written, I think that's, that's fine. But just also want to speak to that, that staff won't have the time to do these significant rewrites before Thursday and, and generate anything meaningful this week. If that's the intent is to have a more meaningful dialogue with some revisions. Thank you. Uh, Council member Tadgett. Yeah, the only thing I was gonna mention is with due respect to with what Russ just mentioned, I still would like to get feedback, but I think everyone's like, let's get <clears throat> feedback that's from both sides of this issue. Maybe we push it out. I don't think this is something we have to tackle really, really fast. Why don't we push it out a couple of weeks, give staff some time to re-rate some areas that we might have some concerns in, put the thoughts out there, and then give the staff some time to reach out to some of these VRBO people or Airbnb people so that way they can come in and voice or send letters of support in or give us thoughts as well. Because in, in a week's time, we're probably going to get the same group of people that have already shown frustration versus people who there's a lot of success stories out there with this as well. So I... I think a little bit of time might give us time to reach out to some of the Airbnbs so they can write a letter or they can do that and they can look at the proposed uh, amendments and look what we've got on the table. Because I think if a lot of people looked at this who just own property, saw this, they would feel like their property rights are under attack a little bit here. So I think a little bit of time here, give the staff a little bit of time to write up some proposed changes and then give the city time to reach out to some of the Airbnb might give us better feedback in which to draft something different on or better or however we're getting responses. So um, there isn't a rush on this. I mean, um, is there, is it okay with the council if we 
push that off till the 24th instead of doing it on the 10th? Is anyone averse to that? I'm seeing heads, so thumbs up. So it looks like, uh, Marcus, thank you for that suggestion. So Russ and David, it looks like we can um, do a preliminary um, redraft of the ordinance um, and then uh, present that. And if we can, I, I would appreciate it if we could reach out to the 28 folks that are currently listed um, to make them aware directly that this is something that's going on. They may not be aware. Um, I will let you know, I stayed in Airbnb last month and I um, let the tenant know their city was considering the same similar thing. I told them they should get involved because <laughs> they want to make sure that they can weigh in on that. So um, David, is that um, you, did you have something you want to add? Yeah, I was just going to follow up kind of related to that. So yeah, we can definitely do outreach. I mean, the thing with Airbnb or VRBO is we don't know the specific names. We know like their usernames and we can send messages through the system. Is that the desire from council that we basically send out kind of, kind of a blank message? Hey, the city of Lake Stevens is considering adopting updated regulations for short-term rentals and the council specifically requested feedback from the, from the VRBO community. Um, you know, uh, these are obviously operating without the, rec the currently required licenses, but we were going to be doing some outreach anyway. So I would just like some direction. Do you want us to have that direct contact through the, through the different website, um, you know, that, that provide these services? That's something, you know, we can potentially do. Or would you rather have us rely kind of on social media and getting the word out there and uh, having it try to kind of trickle out that way? Or should we take into, be taking the more direct approach? I mean, my preference is a direct approach because I, um, you know, for those that don't do social media or um, may not follow the city's Facebook page, um, but I, I'm certainly open to thoughts from, from others of the council. Mary? You're good with that? Yeah, I am. I'm very much direct. Like approach. Reaching yes. out directly? Yes. Okay. I see a thumbs up from Angie, um, thumbs up from Kim and Marcus. So it sounds like they will, we'll go ahead and do direct outreach to the, those 28 folks. Um, and we'll have a redraft of the ordinance um, with the uh, suggestions that are included. Um, and I do, one question I do have with our, and I appreciate the mayor bringing this up, we don't have hotels here. I'm, I'm curious of those 28 folks um, that have those, how does our lodging capacity compare to, let's say Snohomish or Marysville? I guess it's hard to tell with the hotels that are there. Do we have any idea like how much lodging we have available relative to our population? Are you asking in terms of short-term rentals or short -term rentals, number yes. of beds? Short-term rental, we don't have a hotel, so we wouldn't be able to go that route, uh, but in terms of short-term rentals. Yeah, we can try to do some data collection, what other communities around us look like. Okay, thank you. All right, well, that uh, was a, a robust discussion there. Thank you so much for, um, for sharing that. Um, so we'll move on to um, Shannon. Um, thank you for your patience. Uh, we'll get to you on the private and public stormwater infrastructure um, maintenance review. Okay, let me just get my computer up and going. Shannon, can I introduce you really quick uh, in the topic as well? Uh, sure, I was just gonna do that. I was gonna get the, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> for those of you, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Aaron Halverson. I am the city's public works director, uh, and thank you, Council President Ewing, for uh, the opportunity to present tonight on our uh, update of private uh, ponds and vault maintenance uh, strategies uh, and numbers uh, and so forth. And Shannon has done a fantastic job with her team uh, gathering the data over the first quarter of the year. Uh, and we're, we're bringing this data back to you to um, sort of provide some uh, <clears throat> thoughts on an approach perhaps uh, that we can uh, continue to suss out as we gather more information. So take it from there, Shannon. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for having me. I'm Shannon Front. I'm the Surface Water Coordinator with the city. and. 
Tonight, we're going to be presenting on stormwater facilities, specifically um, privately owned and operated stormwater facilities. This was a topic that came up last year, at the end of last year, and we determined um, at that earlier discussion that we needed some additional data. So tonight, we just want to give you an update on where we're at with collecting that data. Um, and as Erin mentioned, um, some of the options moving forward and what that might look like. So we'll go ahead and jump in. Um, I'm just going to briefly go over um, why we're doing this, the purpose behind it, uh, how we collected that data and what we saw from it, and then some of the data challenges that we see currently and how we're going to mitigate those challenges. And then really the, the big discussion topics is what are we going to do next? Um, so really this is, this is being driven by a regulatory component. The city operates um, stormwater management under the NPDES phase two municipal permit. It's outlined in the municipal permit that the city will need to have a program in place to verify adequate long-term operation and maintenance of stormwater treatment and flow control facilities that the city permits. So these are facilities that the city is permitting to be developed when you know, single family homes go in, when we have um, plots go in, any kind of redevelopment, and then anything that that's happened that we've annexed in as well. So this is really being driven by this regulatory component. And when we talk about stormwater facilities, um, specifically in this presentation, we're really talking about flow control and treatment facilities which are also commonly known as uh, detention ponds and vaults and detention pipes, et cetera. Um, there are some kind of low impact facilities out there. There's just not as many of them. Um, and we really don't have a good handle on those. And those would be in the form of bioretention cells, rain gardens. So um, tonight's focus is really on what are our primary facilities and those are detention ponds and vaults. Um, and we really have we really have kind of three different ways that we look at these facilities. We have private residential stormwater facilities, which are in neighborhoods that either have an HOA or don't have an HOA. We have um, private commercial stormwater facilities. So that's stormwater facilities that serve um, Safeway and that complex there and other kind of commercial developments. And then we have city owned uh, stormwater facilities. So tonight's topic is primarily going to be on um, private residential stormwater facilities. And we really wanna talk about these ones um, primarily because these are really the hardest ones to uh, perhaps bring up to a standard. The city does not own or maintain or operate these facilities. And really when we start looking at facilities that are commonly shared by you know, 30 plus homeowners with no common HOA, you're really looking at in dealing with, you know, 30 individual homeowners to talk about bringing one facility into compliance. So this will be our main focus for tonight. Uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, we, we brought this to council's attention at the end of last year, we decided that we needed some more data on exactly what is out there. So we did, um, we did do some data collection from January to March of this year. It's kind of hard to see in this photo here, but we utilized our GIS, our known GIS information and aerial imagery, but we also just did a lot of um, on the ground research. We had our stormwater inspector out. Um, it's, this is a grid that this photo is showing, and I know it's a little bit hard to see, but he really did. He went um, kind of grid by grid and just went out looking for these detention ponds and vaults and made sure to uh, map them and then also assess the condition of them. So that was the data collection process. You'll see here too, um, I did put down that we will start inspecting for commercial facilities once we've finished our inspection of the city facilities. The city facilities were inspected in 2021. We are reinspecting them in 2022 as mandated by the permit. Um, so that's just kind of the data collection process and plan for this year. 
So um, really our big drive for this is we wanted to get a sense of what is the condition of these facilities, these private residential stormwater facilities. We inspect these facilities based on the maintenance standards outlined in the 2019 Stormwater Management Manual. Um, that is a requirement of the permit that we have these standardized maintenance or standards. And so um, what we did here is just to get a really broad sense of where these facilities sit, um, we kind of grouped these maintenance standards and we grouped them into just routine annual maintenance kind of some minor, um, minor moderate repairs or maintenance, and then the complete overhaul, which we're calling the major repairs. By doing this, we were able to kind of break down our data and really assess each of the facilities and assign, assign a cost to it. Um, I do want you to be aware that this cost is really a ballpark, um, really based on averages. And it just kind of gives us a metric to work with um, when we're looking at just scale of the need for something to be done. Um, hey, Shannon, so, I have a quick yeah. question on that. Um, so yeah. are these costs um, for the city to do it? Or is this something that we would contract out? Um, we, we will kind of dive more into that. But to answer okay. your question directly, um, it would be either. Um, it would primarily be with the city. I think if we were going to contract this out, we would see some more elevated costs than what we have represented here. But like I said, it's really, um, really what we're looking at is a, a, an average. And, and we'll kind of go into a little bit more during the discussion point and I can um, maybe answer your question a little bit better um, at that time, if that's all right with you. That's great. Okay. So let me just give you a breakdown of what we found. Uh, we went out to these residential um, neighborhoods, we looked for their stormwater facilities, and what we found were there was 83 detention ponds and 34 vaults, and we inventoried a total of 117 facilities. One of the things that we thought would be really helpful to look at, specifically because we're talking about the instance of an HOA versus not an HOA, and we've commonly found that some of these older developments are the ones that no longer have an HOA in place or the HOA has dissolved. Um, so we, we looked at the year that the plats uh, were recorded. And so in this diagram on the bottom, you can see that about 28% of the known facilities, so 28% of the 117 facilities, are in subdivisions that had a recorded final plat date, um, you know, more than 20 years ago. Um, so this just kind of helps paint the picture of what we're looking at out there. Um, and then this next, this next slide here, you'll see in these two graphs, these are those maintenance standards that we looked at in the earlier slides. I can just run back real quick these. We took the data and we broke it up so that we could see, okay, of those 117 facilities that we inventory, what's the status of them? You'll see here that the vaults primarily meet maintenance standards. And that's actually pretty typical. Vaults um, are relatively newer. Um, I think in a lot of the older subdivisions, we see more detention ponds. And with that being said, um, when you have a vault to you, um, if it's in a newer subdivision, you likely have an HOA that's in place. And so um, there wasn't a lot of issues with the vaults that were inventory, but you will see about 50% of the de detention ponds, um, they, they need some major repairs. And, and that's really is consistent with what our staff have seen um, working in the communities, doing our stormwater inspections, going out on stormwater calls and listening to issues from um, the community about some of these failing detention ponds. Oh, if I can find my mouse, okay. So if we just bring this back to those basic costs that I outlined previous in that previous slide when we were talking about the different groups of uh, maintenance, you know, we're looking at there is 11 detention ponds that needed that moderate maintenance. And if we assigned a cost of 10,000 to those 11, you're looking at 110,000. 41 of them needed major repairs. Um, you know, it's 1.6 million at 40,000. And that 40,000 really represents 
um, kind of an overhaul of those. It's likely pulling out large woody debris, taller trees, uh, recontouring the ponds, removing a lot of deposited sediment so that we could get that pond back down to the designed elevation. Uh, similarly with the vaults though, as you saw in the pie chart diagrams, there weren't a lot of maintenance needs. And so they really don't represent um, the high cost. So if we're gonna put an overall cost to this, just to give some sort of metric of what we're looking at in a scale, um, this would be a cost that would bring those private stormwater facilities that we inventoried up to a standard. So that would come up to the standards that are outlined in the stormwater management manual. That doesn't include uh, annual maintenance costs. So once those are all brought up into the standard, on average, it's about $2,000 um, per facility per year to just perform annual maintenance. Um, and so when I when I give you that 2,000, it, it really is more closely related to um, having city staff probably do it uh, versus having a contractor do it. Um, so we'll just keep that in mind for our discussion. I mentioned that there are some data deficiencies and so I, I wanna go over what those look like. Um, we, coming into this, the city has um, multiple layers. And when I say layers, that's in the ArcGIS system. And a layer is um, what you see when you bring up a map, you'll see, oh, there's ponds and vaults. So those are the layers. But um, over the years, and I think annexing some areas and bringing in data from the county, we've had multiple layers, and we may have a pond represented in multiple layers. So it was challenging to discern um, which, which layers uh, were duplicates and where we may be missing data. So we've actually, we've started this process and we're almost done with it. We've gone through all of our stormwater GIS data and we've uh, migrated it to a standardized geo database with the help of Zachary, our asset management um, person. And we're on target to um, publish that new standardized geo database, hopefully within the next couple weeks. Um, I'm hoping by this Friday. Uh, what that's going to do for us is that's really going to standardize our system, allow staff to map things um, more easily, and just give us a better view of what, what known data we have out there. Once we have that up and running, we'll compare that information with our inspections and then see if we've possibly missed any facilities or if there's any more ground truthing that needs to happen. So those are really our next steps forward when we um, talk about data. I also mentioned earlier in the presentation uh, when we're talking about flow control facilities, I mentioned detention pipes. Detention pipes are really, they're just larger pipes. So you may have a standard conveyance system in a road or um, in between two different facilities. And that detention pipe is just a, a larger pipe meant to hold more water. So they're really not as easily seen. Um, so when we had staff go out and do just visual reconnaissance in the field and ground toothing and looking for those ponds and vaults, uh, it's not easy as easy for them to see detention pipes. So that might be one area where we have some data deficiencies. And once we have our GIS data cleaned up, we'll be able to identify where all those detention pipes are um, and go back out and verify that with, with our GIS data. So really the, the whole question that we bring to you tonight is there's, how do we move forward? What, do our, what does this look like moving forward? As you remember, this is a regulatory requirement to make sure that these facilities meet a certain standard. Uh, they have water quality and flow control impacts if they are deficient in meeting those standards. So that's an impact on our community and on our water quality. Right now, um, there's really two paths that we see moving forward. And this is what we're really hoping to gain um, council's perspective on. And if you have any questions, but those two paths are looking at our stormwater management utility fees and revising them to either um, take over the operation and maintenance of these residential facilities as the city, um, bring them into compliance one time and then work with education and outreach. Um, but really that 
in order to compensate for doing any kind of work on these facilities, um, we would likely need to increase the stormwater management utility fee. And then the other option is to continue with the regulatory framework that we have in place in our municipal code now. Um, that does give the city the ability to go in and maintain these and then bill the homeowners respectively for the work that was done. Um, to date, that, that hasn't happened, um, but that's definitely an option moving forward. And so with that, I'm, I'm going to open it up um, to discussion, and I'm happy to answer any questions or clarify anything. I will just note, I don't have it up here on the slide, but um, you know, I talk about the rate study here. There was a rate study done in 2018. In that rate study, there was a level of service five that was considered, and that level of service five represented actually taking over the maintenance of these private facilities. Um, that's not the level of service that the city chose to move forward with at the time of the 2018 rate study, but it's definitely something that we can review um, and evaluate based on what we know today and what we know about future costs and see if it's something that's, you know, an option to increase the, the swim fees. And when we talk about increasing the swim fees, we, you know, staff just did some really basic preliminary calculations, looking at level of service five, looking at the standards of the inspected facilities. Um, you know, it, it's likely, if we're just talking about order of magnitude, that it, the swim fees would have to increase possibly between 20 and $40 per year. And that's for one equivalent service unit. All single family residential homes are charged one um, equivalent service unit. And then commercial developments are charged based on the amount of impervious surface. So that I, I just want to throw that out there just to kind of give you a frame of reference and an order of magnitude. So um, with that, I'd like to open it up for discussion. Councilmember Tad, or uh, excuse me, Daughtry. So I want to go back a little bit, um, Shannon, on retention pipes. Could you explain what those look like? Yeah, so detention pipes, um, they're, they really are just larger pipes in the ground. They may in be, be between two catch, excuse me, they're likely in between two catch basins and um, they can range in size. There's some detention pipes out there that are maybe four feet in diameter, but um, they're just larger pipes used to hold more water as they convey it. Okay, so that's like the one that's right next to my house. Got it. Um, Probably. <laughs> that comes from the street and goes directly out to Stevens Creek. Got it. Um, the other question that I had then is, uh, this is all well and good, and this is something that we asked for, and I appreciate your presentation and the work that has been done in this, because we really did need to understand it that at this level, and maybe even a little deeper uh, later on. But what about, when we get done with this, what about places that have no stormwater facilities at all? What You're happens, what happens there, and how how is that affecting our, our is that affecting our NPDES? Um, are you talking about um, maybe so, like residential homes that don't have any stormwater facilities associated with them? Well, I'm sure that we have some that are um, older places that have absolutely no stormwater. It just goes into a ditch and goes wherever it goes. Yeah. I don't know if those are adequate or those are called for in NPDES or, or are they allowed? They are. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. That, that's an excellent question. Um, yeah. So they are allowed. And then those, those homes would still be in compliance because they're, they're not really um, subject to compliance. When we start, um, so for example, if, if we have a, a home, a single family residence that is, doesn't have any kind of stormwater management or doesn't feed into any kind of common stormwater management, that's that's not an issue. That's how that home was likely built, um, you know, back in the 60s or 70s. It's only when that parcel is redeveloped that it would need to go in. It would likely need to have some stormwater management associated with it based on the new codes. Um, just because these 
parcels are older and they don't have it does not put them out of compliance. It's the ones that do have it that are not functioning as designed. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions from uh, council members? Oh, I would make a comment on the two steps forward. I am more uh, apt to go with the uh, stormwater uh, fees for everybody, you know, like we, you know, instead of going with complete, a, complete the work and send a bill. I also noticed that in your staff report, you had that Snohomish County maintains all the private stormwater facilities without a financial penalty to the homeowners or the HOAs. Marysville basically has a grant program to encourage that maintenance and Monroe maintains all private facilities without financial penalty. I'd like to see what maybe some of the others do, but I, I am more of a, let's, for instance, let's say that my property is old enough. I don't have, have no stormwater facilities other than this giant four foot pipe that goes down between two houses, it goes directly out to the thing. I'd, I'd like to pay my fair share of stormwater fees because I have stormwater that's coming off of my driveway and going into uh, Stevens Creek. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm more apt to do that than I am for let's penalize an HOA or, you know, 10 or 12 or 15 people on a small HOA to get them back into compliance. Yeah. And, and I will note too, um, cause you bring up a really good point. You know, there are people here in the city that, um, don't have a, a common stormwater facility and they would still be paying, uh, presumably an increased rate. But it really, it, it does come down to um, water quality and flow control, which is a community benefit. Yeah, we're, uh, looking at, we're looking at it as a utility at that point. Mm -hmm. So I do have a question um, for Director Halverson, maybe it's better, maybe um, looking at the 41 that we have that are in need of significant um, repairs, what capacity do we have from a labor standpoint to accomplish that work in a timely manner? It's a great question, uh, Council President Ewing. We, right now we are trying to inspect all of our catch basins to maintain compliance, just simple inspections of catch basins in our MS4 pipes and catch basins and right-of-way issues, uh, right-of-way structures. Uh, we do not right now have capacity to go do the maintenance in these private ponds. Uh, it is very labor intensive. It requires a lot of equipment. Uh, and it, we did, Shannon and I did talk about what it would take. And we think it would take between two and four additional stormwater employees plus equipment to do this work uh, over a five year period. I'm not talking the first year, it would be uh, 10 pond, you know, it might be 10 ponds a year to get those 40 up to speed. And in the meantime, we're trying to maintain all of our other infrastructure. I do also want to say, does that answer your question? It, it does. So I'm just doing the, the mental math on that. So if we have four FTEs plus equipment, you know, over a year and we're doing 10 a year, um, you know, the, I, I don't know how well that pencils out, but um uh, certainly it, it, it would be nice to look at a, what that would look like, um, you know, so we can project based on, you know, stormwater fees and, and what that would look like and incapacity for us to be able to absorb that should we go in that direction. Yeah, and, and we can certainly bring that back to you. Yeah, and I do want to clarify, clarify one thing too. Um, when, when Aaron talks about doing 10 a year, that's to bring these ones that really haven't been touched in 20 plus years in some cases um, up to a standard and then that would be you know consistent annual maintenance thereafter but we yeah, yeah we can look into that more yeah i know there's one uh, development next to mine that has probably you know 18 to 24 inch trees and there's probably 30 or 40 of them uh mm -hmm. cottonwoods you know that are probably 100 feet tall i mean that would just be a complete disaster like trying to <laughs> trying yeah. to clean that up. I mean, I just couldn't even imagine the, um, the manpower and time and, and, and that, that would take to, to do that. Um, Council Member Peter Shagan. Yeah, Shannon, I, <clears throat> maybe I missed this in your presentation, but what is the present policy of the city 
um, as far as accepting or uh, I guess, what is the maintenance obligation of a new plat that installs a storm drainage system for 40 lots? Is it dedicated to the city or is it obligated to be maintained by the HOA? It's dedicated to the individual homeowners in most cases. Um, they do have an HOA in place and they are required to have an HOA in place to manage that for these new um, plats that go in. But the way that most of the plat language is written that we've seen even with the older plats is there'll be a common track you know, for the stormwater facility and it is dedicated to individual homeowners and you know, one, one each individual homeowner has one thirtieth interest or one you know however many homes are within that plot that that stormwater facility serves. Okay, so I, I guess that's you know what I wrestle with in having developed plats is um, when you do a plat and you do that type of situation where it's dedicated to one thirtieth ownership in the plat or whatever. You know, ninety nine percent of the time a year after you turn the HOA over to that neighborhood, the first thing they say is, how do we go about lowering our HOA dues? <laughs> and so therein lies the problem in the sense that there doesn't seem to be a mechanism to keep that HOA in place for the purpose of maintaining that pond, which they are obligated to do. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that, you know, we as a city, we need to make a policy decision to either... <clears throat> put some enforcement mechanism in place to keep those HOAs active and enforce the obligation to maintain their storm drainage facility, or we're, we need to accept the responsibility and say every pond that's developed for every residential subdivision in this city is going to be dedicated to the city because you run the risk of non-compliance with our NPDES permit, which could be a problem since we have this wonderful lake in front of us. And so I guess that's what I wrestle with is, is how do you balance that? Um, in a perfect world, it would be great to have all the ponds dedicated to the city, but how do you pay for it? And then, the reverse of that is, you know, it is up to the individual responsibility of the neighborhoods to maintain their own impacts to the storm drainage system. So can you sh uh, shed some wisdom, I guess, as to how do we balance that conundrum? Yeah, I mean, I, I really think that that's the heart of the conversation tonight is what what does that balance look like and what should that balance look like? Um, there's definitely the opportunity to have a policy in place or more of an enforcement mechanism in place to address uh, new plots and subdivisions where the HOA is uh, still intact, but we still have the issue of the subdivisions that do not have a homeowners association and haven't for possibly 15 plus years, and then how are we going to address those ones? So um, would there be a remedy as to, um, and I don't want to say this is punitive, but at the same time, if a 20 year old subdivision has never maintained their pond and is in a situation like council member Ewing explained, it's really not fair for the rest of the ratepayers to go back and fix that problem. Is there a way to maybe do a one-time fix uh, fee to assess those property owners. And after that fix is done, then that pond is turned over to the city for future uh, maintenance and responsibilities. So Gary, I've got, let me, let me jump in there really quick. Um, in most of these cases, those people that are there now weren't there to begin with and weren't the people that were responsible in the first place for the HOA because houses have been sold over and over and over again. I can still see where you're coming from on that and it might still be applicable, uh, but I think it'd be a real tough sell if you don't well, if you move into a building that doesn't have an HOA and all of a sudden you're telling them they have to pay these fees. The other tough sell though is to pay, is to 
is to penalize the global rate payer for non maintenance, non obligations or dis of obligations from from the past. Like I say, that I you know. 90% of the time the HOA gets formed. And the first thing they say is, why is our fees 150 bucks a month? Well, 120 of it goes to storm drainage. Well, we don't need that. So then they cut it down to 30 bucks a month. And guess what happens? It doesn't get maintained. And so is that, you know, how do you, are, are you going to put that responsibility back on the global rate payer to make up for that, um, irresponsibility of not maintaining an obligation that was that was in set in place in the conditions of the final plat. No, I, I heard I hear what you're saying and I agree with what you're saying. I think Marcus could bring some light under this being he has management of several HOAs. Marcus, you want to weigh in? Sure. Um, I would say uh, a lot of what Gary is saying is true. A lot of times they want to lower fees, but the legislature has made it so that way associations have to do reserve studies now. And if they don't, they'll lose their ability to um, lend homes in that community because they won't be FHA approved. So no one in there can get FHA financing. Part of that reserve study outlines all the things that they have to do that are mandated to take care of in that community, which is ponds, maintenance. And then a lot of them, almost all of them have management companies who we are looking at doing the backflow testing. We're looking at the cleaning of the ponds in appropriate amount of times. Um, I think it's some of these defunct HOAs that had an HOA at a time, but then nobody wanted it. And then they said, well, we don't want to pay for it. We're not going to do it. And so they didn't want an HOA because everyone, you know, doesn't want to have an HOA, but they're there for a reason. I, I kind of agree with Gary. These people who live in these associations or in these communities that have water retention, They've been getting away with not paying for five years. And when you buy a home in a community like this, you know that there's fees that go along with it. There's no free rights here, right? So part of me thinks that if they're not going to do that, and I've always told them the city has the ability to go in and clean these ponds and assess you if you guys don't do it yourselves. And I think that's where some of these associations are at. The ones that are managing and doing that and provide the certificate to the city, I think we should let them stay on their way. I just don't like the global aspect of paying for a lot of these homes that people haven't been maintaining their, their, you know, their requirements for their retention ponds and, you know, water. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at with it. I think a lot of the newer associations, they understand that they have all these things. And the, um, the first thing that is told in the changeover meetings when we're doing them and other people are doing them is you have to maintain these items according to the agreements that is made with the city. So Greg, did you um, have something you wanted to weigh in on? Oh, well, I was just going to uh, say that uh, the, uh, it's, it's not uncommon uh, for, for cities to require uh, with, uh, with new plats that the homeowners association, that the stormwater facilities go to an association and the association bylaws have to be approved by the city there have to be provisions in there for the collection of sufficient uh, uh, funds from the property owners uh, to pay for the uh, facilities, uh, that the HOA cannot be uh, uh, disbanded or cease collecting funds uh, without the uh, permission of the city. Uh, I think there's maybe some stronger language that we can start including in our uh, uh, requirements uh, uh, to make sure that these uh, facilities do uh, uh, get maintained. Another thing we might want to look at is in terms of rates, of stormwater rates. Uh, I think you can have reasonable categories for different rates. And uh, uh, if, for example, you could have a category of rate for uh, properties that uh, uh, are... Uh, that uh, to which uh, their stormwater drains to a facility that's not being uh, maintained by through through an HOA, uh, as opposed to a rate for those that are. Uh, I think these are things that we can look at in determining, well, how do we get money 
uh, from property owners that might fairly then be uh, be used to uh, pay for uh, uh, improvements that the uh, homeowners individually themselves just are incapable of, uh, uh, of making. So there's some options there too to look at. So, so Greg, you're saying that um, we could uh, identify, you know, like stormwater, the units that are associated with an unmaintained stormwater facility and attach a different rate than those who have kept theirs in compliance. Yeah, if, if there are, uh, yeah, for those facilities that the city is going to end up maintaining or doing the work, uh, well, then let's start collecting the money to, uh, to pay for that. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Mayor? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I like Gary's idea of um, bringing some of them up to speed before bringing them into the fold. One of the one of the problems that we would run into that is the administrative costs to, you know, contact 300 homes, let them all know they need to clean it, then they don't clean it, then we tell them we're going to go clean it, and then we go clean it, and then we have to do, you know, then we charge each 300 homes, we get replies from 100 homes, and we've got to charge another 200 homes and do levy or, you know, do liens. And then we hire another Greg and it just becomes the administrative side of that becomes very problematic. I, I agree with you, but I don't know how we do it administratively. I like Greg and I wouldn't mind having another one just so you know, Mayor. I, I don't mind a good Greg. Yeah, but, but you're not going to get another Greg. So they're, forget it. Greg's are expensive. So. <laughs> Good. Any other comments or thoughts um, on that? All right. Um, well, yeah, I, I do have one comment. Okay. Go ahead. I, I realize that this is hard. And Shannon, you did a fantastic job. Thank you very much. And Aaron, I know uh, how much you are working your tail off to try to get these things taken care of. And I appreciate that. Um, it is a hard conversation to have. It is hard a nut to crack. And but we really need to buckle down and get this thing figured out because it isn't going to be in the too near, too distant future that we're going to get in trouble uh, with the state if we don't get this figured out. So I think we really need to uh, buckle down on this. I, you know, I'm not one that likes hard problems, but hey, we have it. We've got to fix it. I don't know. You know, we've got a great team of people to help us with this, and we need to fix. We need to just get it done. So if we use the data, it'd be interesting to see. And with um, Director Halverson being able and Shannon being able to tell us like, hey, these are the number ones of 41 that are not in, in di serious disrepair. These are the number of units. This is yeah. how long it would take. And they could, if we start collecting now, the monies could be there. It would be spread out over more time instead of, hey, you've got 50 homes and now you're on the hook for $40,000. Um, it could be spread out over a couple of years instead of um, spread out um, over, if I'm understanding Greg correctly, uh, over more time to make it more tolerable for people's budgets. Um, Councilmember Jarrett. Thank you. In that same vein, kind of what I was thinking is, I, I do think we need to do something. I think we need to start. Um, and I wonder about starting with sending some correspondence to, you know, all the homeowners to say, this is what we've assessed. This is what we've assessed as the cost to bring your stormwater area into compliance. Here are your three choices. You can do nothing and the city will do it, or you can do it, or, you know, what, whatever we decide the choices are. But I, I just wonder if we need to start communicating to those residences, like, hey, we're paying attention to this. There's going to need to be something done. Here are a couple options. Here's the expected cost. And then start having those conversations with those homeowners. And maybe there is a five-year plan. Maybe it is, you know, 16 houses with a $40,000 bill and they need five years to be able to kind of figure that out. But I just think we have to, we can't keep coming to the table and planning and not doing anything, I think. So in that vein, Angie, so what um, what's our direction then to um, to Director Halverson and his team? In my opinion? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
I, I would love to see a draft letter that we're going to send out to the homeowners in our city that are, that have these, um, retaining ponds that need attention and us to come up with, you know, what are, or, or for Aaron, for you and your team to come up with what the options are and start sending those out and seeing what the response is. I do have one question that I didn't get answered. Um, Shannon, so you, have you completed the entire inventory for the city of Lake Stevens or is this a partial inventory? No, we've completed the inventory of all the known ones and ones that we could find. Um, once we go through all of our GIS data, there may be some um, outliers in the GIS data that we may have not inventoried, at which time we will go and ground truth those to see if it's an error in GIS or if it's something that we may have missed. Um, but like I um, mentioned before, we did this you know, ground truthing with a grid system. So we believe we've inventoried all of the private detention ponds and vaults that are out there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gary? I would suggest that we also add to our discussion a policy decision that says within, and I'm just picking a couple of numbers, but within five to seven years, the goal is of the city is to own and operate all of the retention ponds uh, within the city <clears throat> and to make the city is the ultimate uh, responsible official for compliance with the MPDES permit storm drainage water quality issue. And so it would seem to me that we would want to have control of those facilities that are impacting the overall water quality system in the city of lakes or in this lake stevens watershed so i don't think it's um financially feasible to do it any sooner than five years but i think there needs to be a goal that at some point in time the city recognizes that we need to con take control of these facilities so in that vein excellent comment gary so in that vein um shannon what would it take for us to get a projection in terms of um, timelines like that director Hollerson was talking about, you know, take, said he'd think it's take about five years for us to be able to bring those in compliance. Is there a way that we can get something like that? So we have kind of a vision and a goal. I, I like the idea of having a goal and a target and that way we can also budget in FTEs and plan, you know, the stormwater fees and things like that to, uh, reflect that vision. Yeah, so if I'm hearing you correctly, um, to have that kind of vision and that timeline and a program like that in place, we would need to address our stormwater fees to be able to, um, to pay for that kind of plan. So I really think that our first step would be to um, look at the data some more, look at that 20, uh, 2018 rate study and come back to council, um, you know, possibly early fall or late summer with what an increase in the stormwater management fee would look like and how that would be spread out in bringing these into compliance over X amount of time. Uh, did I understand that correctly? Yes, because ultimately those are, it's gonna be, be fee-based. And so we need to make sure that we have a, a good understanding of what that would, what that would look like. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or thoughts from council members? Thank you so much, um, Shannon. Really appreciated the presentation. Um, so you're up next for the next item. So yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, no problem. So let me just um, let me end this one, and I can just bring up the next one. Just give me one moment. Okay, so the next item I have to share with the group today is um, the NPDES permit requires us to adopt the 2019 Stormwater Management Manual um, by June of this year. Currently, the city manages stormwater um, design for 
flow control and treatment based on the 2012 stormwater management manual that was amended in 2014. Um, so this is again another regulatory uh, requirement that we adopt this 2019 manual. Uh, other jurisdictions, surrounding jurisdictions have already adopted it. Snohomish County does use their own drainage manual and that was, um, they had that approved by Department of Ecology to be able to adopt their own. Um, there's really nine, there's, there's really nine key differences um, to the 2019 stormwater management manual compared to the 2014 manual. None of them are really expected to have a large impact on development here in the city. A lot of it, um, at least from the plans and proposal projects that I have reviewed, already conform to them. Um, you know, developers and people that are used to developing in this area are already familiar with the 2019 manual and already comply with it. Um, I can briefly just go over these nine um, key changes if you'd like, or if anyone has some specific questions on them, um, you know, I'm happy to answer those as well. Um, so I guess I can open up for discussion. Okay, I'll be the stupid one here. What's, okay. a B, what's BMP stand for? That is an excellent question. Um, it stands for best management practice. Oh, Jesus Christ. Or behavior management. Good question, management. though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Councilmember Frederick? Yeah, working for a consultant, I should have known that. Sean? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Ewing. Uh, Shannon, just really quickly, um, you, you mentioned that a lot of your practice is already. Uh, sort of incorporate uh, what we are considering adopting here. Is it safe to say that, that what we're considering adopting here is consistent with our current practices and best practices that we're already moving forward with? Yes, um, I believe so. One of the big things here that you can see in this number one of this is one of the things is a continuous simulation model. What this has an impact on is sizing of best management practices or stormwater facilities. So it's looking at the data, the rainfall data um, in a continuous cumulative aspect um, so that essentially detention facilities might be sized a bit larger than um, with a non-continuous model. Most of what I see already come through um, our desk is uh, developers and engineers are already using the continuous simulation model for developing their stormwater facilities. So I really don't see it as a, a big change. Um, some of the other things here that have changed are, are actually give a little bit more flexibility to developments, um, like um, some of this equivalent service area that actually allows for developers and people that are redeveloping to maybe treat for uh, surfaces that are existing, so don't require treatment, but if it's more conducive to placement of facilities, they can kind of trade it for some of the areas that they've redeveloped that would require the treatment. Um, one of the other maybe things to note, more significant things to note is uh, number two, replaced hard surfaces development threshold. The stormwater management manual has two flow charts that, that determine um, what type of stormwater management is required. And those two flow charts address new development and they address redevelopment. Redevelopment is defined as 35% of the site is already developed and you're just um, redoing it, therefore needing to bring it into current codes. One of the uh, questions that come up in the redevelopment is, does the redevelopment add 50% more value to the project? Now, the language was a little bit loose in the previous manual, and it cited the project site or the, the site. Um, so the good example for this would be, and, and really the language pertains to the project site, so the area of disturbance. And a really good example that Ecology gave us when we were trying to understand this component was, if you have a strip mall and you're going to redevelop one shop within that strip mall, the overall value of redevelopment is not more than 50% of the entire strip mall, but it is more than 50% for that shop. 
And so this is really identifying it's just the project site, that area of disturbance. That 50% value comes into play when you start talking about um, certain requirements that are needed for the stormwater management, whether or not flow control would be triggered or the need for treatment would be triggered. So that's really the only one that um, that language kind of identifies that a little bit better. We don't see that very often. Um, maybe we'll start to see it more as some of our um, existing commercial areas uh, do some redevelopment, but um, that's kind of the only other one that I saw as um, something to address or call out. All right, thank you. Uh, Gary? Yeah, Shannon, just quickly, um, number one, do we have a choice to not adopt the 2019 Storm Drainage Manual? And number two, my guess is that uh, by adopting this, uh, things will be more inexpensive to develop. Being rather facetious there, but um, once again, the layering of regulations, here we go. Yeah, so to answer your question, um, no, we, we don't really have a choice. Uh, we, we do have an option, um, and I will just caution you with this option. We, we have a choice of adopting the 2019 Stormwater Management Manual or the Snohomish County Drainage Manual. I personally am not familiar with the Snohomish County Drainage Manual. It is not uh, more lenient than the 2019 Stormwater Management Manual. The ecology supports the Stormwater Management Manual. In order for another jurisdiction or entity to have their own drainage manual, they must meet all the requirements outlined in the 2019 Stormwater Management Manual and also provide more stringent requirements. Um, you know, like I said, there's other jurisdictions have already adopted the 2019 manual. We already see it referenced in some of the engineering um, drainage reports that we receive for project applications because they're familiar with it and they're used to using the 2019 manual. I really don't foresee any um, large impacts um, or issues with the adoption of the newer version. Did that hopefully answer all of your question? <laughs> All right, any, uh, any other comments or questions for Shannon on this presentation? All right, um, thank you, Shannon, um, for that. And uh, you're off. Mary, Mary had her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't see her on my screen here. Mary? No, I just want to say, wow. Shannon, wow, we're so lucky to have you. I feel very informed and I really appreciate the hard work that made this happen. And let's move forward and make it happen. There's nothing more important uh, in Lake Stevens than our water, I have to say. And we need to pay attention so we don't get ourselves in trouble. And thank you so much for your hard work and you as well, Aaron, of course. Thanks, Mary. Excellent. All right, um, so our last um, discussion, uh, we have Barb. Oh, we do have Barb, okay. Sorry about that. I shared my screen before I uh, unmuted myself and had to find the buttons. Um, good afternoon, evening. Oh, it's evening. Evening council. Um, so we're gonna go over tonight the uh, pandemic recovery budget and the potential reauthorization of uh, available funds. Just as a reminder, um, in October of 2021, the council uh, uh, accepted the ARPA uh, federal grant funds and authorized the uses of those funds. Um, the majority of those uses are outlined in uh, this uh, document. In April of 22, um, after the treasury came out with their final rule, um, the resolution was amended to use uh, the ARPA grant funds um, and allowed the mayor to elect the standard allowance for the lost revenues for to be used for any uh, governmental service. And so for ease of reporting, the city is uh, reporting and claiming staff payrolls and uh, benefit costs to the Department of Treasury. By using the ARPA funds um, received for the payroll and benefit costs, the reimbursed funds become unrestricted. This allows the city more flexibility in their use um, to include uh, 
things outside of what was originally outlined in the grant agreement. So this list I have uh, on my screen shows the initial list of the authorized uses by council. Um, this has been reviewed by the management team and um, we'll kind of go over a few of these things. Once I get through this, Russ will have um, a presentation that will go into deeper detail about the projects that are being uh, recommended. So the first thing you'll see is at the top, the pandemic recovery budget, you'll notice that it is updated to uh, 9,475,000. That was included in our budget amendment. That was uh, included the additional funding we received um, because other entities had denied uh, or declined to receive funding. So it went from 9.446 to 9.475. So that's the first thing. Then in the first column, you'll see the category of the expenditure. Then what was previously reviewed by council, those are the things that were originally approved. We have a status column and then the original budget and then the updated. Um, as I mentioned in my staff report, all of the staffing positions have either been hired or in the process of hiring. The one thing that we did remove uh, from the intended use of the pandemic recovery funds is the emergency sick leave that we had set aside. This is actually included as part of the uh, ARPA uh, payroll and benefits claim. So that no longer needs to be in uh, this pandemic fund use. The next thing you'll see is the assistance. So we have the food bank that is in process. Um, just as an update, we have met with the food bank. Um, they intend, we have kind of discussed the contract when they're gonna want their reimbursement. Um, they intend to use the money from Snohomish County first and then come uh, to the city for our portion. That way they can keep the funds separate for accounting and uh, transparency purposes. So it will likely be closer to August when we actually uh, spend out that funding, but we will bring a contract to uh, council prior to that for the approval of uh, the, the funding. Uh, Senior Center, as I mentioned previously, has received their funding. Uh, we do still have a, a Volunteers of America funding in here. We do still have supplies, PPEs, You'll see the old treatment plant uh, feasibility study that is complete and came in under budget. So that leaves some additional funding available. We have the infrastructure market analysis for Hartford. That is uh, the RFP is out for that. Uh, the small business relief that came in uh, right at budget and is completed. We do have the economic development retail recruitment um, that is with uh, retail strategies or is that with urban three? Sorry, I have it on my other spreadsheet, uh, not on this one, but- Retail uh, strategies. Thank you, Russ, thank you. Uh, so retail strategies, and that one was actually negotiated down. Um, so we actually were able to save um, approximately $15,000 over the next uh, couple of years. And year one is complete on that as well. Uh, the next things we have are um, projects and these are, um, a little bit more of what Russ is going to go into um, later, so I won't go into very much of this. Um, the equipment, um, as I mentioned in my staff report, um, Public Works Director Halverson has uh, requested that we uh, not go out for a mini street super as this funding could be used better for accessories for our uh, recently purchased roll-off truck to include uh, snow and ice treatments and those types of things. Um, and that actually saved uh, quite a bit of funding there as well. And then the technology, we had an overall technology budget of up to $500,000. We have gone through um, the um, software and hardware needs. And one of the biggest ones was um, the ViewWorks, which was the public works technology. It was determined that instead of going out and getting a new project or a new product, um, public works would dig in deeper and utilize more of what we already had and add modules to view works in order to um, better utilize that in a, in a fiscally responsible way. So, so there's quite a bit of savings there as well. As you can see, the last item there is Matraya Sewer and Storm. That was a future potential uh, project that is just a, a holding of funding for whatever was left over from ARPA funds. So now that is one of the items that is um, up for potential uh, discussion. So as you can see at the bottom, the available for priority reallocation is just over $3 million. 
So these are the items down here that Russ will talk a bit more about, um, the projects, the Machaya Sewer and Storm, City Hall, um, a few parks. And then there's one that I did want to mention I don't think is in Russ's presentation. And this is um, Human Resource Director Warrington had uh, requested potentially utilizing some of this funding to do the citywide salary survey, which we have um, been talking about for a couple of years. And um, I believe we're in need of doing that. But um, so I will stop sharing my screen and let Russ go into his. Hey, Barb, I just had yeah. one quick question if I can. Sure. Um, the slope mower, I saw that there was listed as like residential and commercial or some configuration there. Um, yes, um, basically I just added that in because it was part of our topic of conversation when we were determining whether or not that slope mower was needed. And um, it was more of an estimate. I know um, uh, Shannon just went into, there's 117 private residential ponds and um, I'm not sure if the 90 city is accurate either. It was sort of a, this is an estimate of the number of ponds, 90 city ponds and 130 private ponds. So basically that was part of the discussion of, yes, this is actually needed, so. Okay, thank you. All right, everyone seeing the screen? Okay, um, as Barb mentioned, I just wanted to go through some of the, the projects and I welcome any um, comments from Director Halverson or others as we, we move through and please stop me, Council, if you have questions. So earlier this year, you went through a list of projects that have been funded with the recovery funds. Now we're calling them the pandemic recovery funds to distinguish from ARPA since we're using the general fund now as that funding source. So Davies Beach is one of the projects that um, funding was allocated about $50,000 and we're using that with other local park dollars and there will be some uh, police dollars and fire dollars going into different parts of this project. The entire project's not $100,000, but I believe that is the pier deck resurfacing and portions of the floating docks being replaced. Eagle Ridge Park, that's a long-standing park that's been on our park project over many phases. We did receive grant funding from Recreation and Conservation Office for about half of the cost. And then the council had put forward about $460,000 in the recovery funding as a match. And then the city would use about another 100,000 from its park mitigation fees to complete that project. It'll go to design later this year and into construction in 2023. Frontier Heights, um, you all know the story of Frontier Heights, a park that the city took over a number of years ago from an HOA. We've substantially completed phase one, which included the trails, redoing the basketball court and some parking. And we are currently seeking about $800,000 in RCO grants for that project. And even with that um, initial investment of 225,000, we do think that we'll need to up that, that dollar amount. And I will come back to this slide in a few minutes. We also have the 20th Street ball fields. Um, council took the action recently to move forward with the acquisition. That's where we're at right now. We estimate the project cost to be about $1.6 million. That would take the new uh, West Side Trail, Powerline Trail, however you'd like to refer to it, from 20th Street to about 8th Street Southeast. And that would also include some upgrades to the, the ball fields, include the dog park, parking, and a small play structure. And $500,000 have been allocated to date from the recovery funds. Some of the money has been invested already in our capital projects, specifically example here, the um, 94th, excuse me, 24th and 91st construction near SR9. Um, so some dollars, about $1.5 million of that have gone into this project, which would lower than the amount we would be bonding. And we do have other funding sources going into this project, including private development that isn't listed here. 
117th Avenue Northeast is one of the projects that has been considered. Um, currently, there's a little over $600,000 that would be allocated to do the stormwater portion of this project. And that would also be coupled up with some other local dollars, about $800,000 to build this section of sidewalk and the infrastructure needed to support that. Okay, so those are the, the projects that the council has already looked at and authorized when we um, gave you the first list of ARPA dollars earlier. And now these are some of the proposed projects. As Barb said, now we have about uh, $3 million. And these are some suggestions on how the council could spend those dollars or they could be held in reserve as we'll get to in a few minutes. So we have the Hartford Machias, uh, Machias area. We've talked about that at retreats and in other venues. The city is currently working on a request for proposals that's gone out. We've had a bidders conference. And so we are waiting for final proposals to come in to figure out um, what is the best um, outcomes for a street infrastructure, stormwater infrastructure, sewer, and the marketing piece, what is the highest and best use for this area? All things that the council has talked about previously, and that is allocated $125,000. And the next steps of this, um, as Barb said, we had just put about a $2.5 million placeholder on this in the past. We know that um, this project will exceed $2.5 million. What the final project costs will be is unknown at this point to do all of the necessary sewer, storm, street um, projects out of there. We also have recently talked about City Hall. At your last retreat, council discussed three primary options. Staff is still working on those options since our last retreat, getting some appraisals of property. So we have a little bit more information to bring back to you. That's another option where you could place some of this um, excess money from, which could potentially reduce a bond amount that council would have to, to look for to help fund along with other funding sources such as property sales. One of the projects that we've been talking about lately, it's not on our project list, but it will be this year, is um, Bonneville Field. We all know there is a need to create more play fields in the city. And so this is one of the ones that we're looking at. There's a current baseball field there. We'd like to turn this into a multi-use um, field and that it would be a turf field. Uh, at this point, we're estimating it would probably be about 1.25 million. We know we'd have to redo the parking lot, the stormwater, as you've heard about, if you touch the existing infrastructure, you're gonna to have to bring it up to standards. So that's something we would be looking at this project. And um, one of the ways you could allocate that money is a million dollars towards this project. Otherwise, we only have about $250,000 potentially of local funds. And I think as we've talked to you um, late last year, we gave you a report on where your impact fees are and we will be bringing that report back to you shortly to help also make some of these decisions. This is kind of exciting. So I said we'd circle back to Frontier Heights and we are actively um, working on some grants, just submitted grants today. And as part of that grant, we had a landscape architect do a design for us for Frontier Heights. This is what a multi-use turf field could look like. So what you see on this slide is there's the baseball diamond and then there's also a soccer field or could be used for lacrosse and just the goals um, would change on that a little bit. You also see that this would include some pickleball courts as that's a, a growing sport in popularity and the, the parking. So again, council had already allocated 225,000 and we believe we'll need at least another 20, uh, 225,000, possibly more depending on what grant funding um, comes through. Russ? Yes. Um, if you maybe it's premature um, to comment on the status or the the likelihood of those grants. I mean, do we have any idea um, our level of confidence in securing those grants? The last time we took 
this project through the, the grant cycle. It didn't make the cut, but it also, it was about middle of the pack. And so it did actually present pretty well. There was just some outstanding projects in front of it. Um, I have a lot of confidence in the youth athletic um, grant. The local park grants is a lot more competitive and we'll expect that competition. And so out of the $800,000 ask, you know, I, I would say we would, we would probably get 300,000, um, obviously hoping for this full amount. Thank you. So this is another project um, that we've talked a, a bit about, the Cedarwood Clubhouse. This is the property that the city took over last year, again, from a homeowners association. It's a decrepit building. We know we have to get out there with some urgent repairs to the roof, siding, windows to secure that space. But to turn it into a functional community space, we really need to add a second floor to that. And so council has authorized a design budget through park funds. And we have started the structural analysis right now. We have a contract with Pace Engineering for $30,000 doing the structural analysis. And then we would roll into doing the architecture for this building, but it's still, um, and then we have this out for a federal grant request for $1.2 million. And then we're suggesting that we could spend recovery funds to do some of these urgent repairs to this building since we didn't get the, the state capital grant this year, this would um, take the place of that. One of the other things that I wanted to, to talk to you about, and council members Daughtry and Ewing have already heard this proposal when we met with the Youth Advisory Council. Staff has been looking at sort of a three-pronged approach to help control the behavior at North Cove Park and some of our other parks. The police have ramped up some of their um, outreach in the park. We've done some education with some new signage. And the, the third prong of this is how do we redirect the behavior into something that's a bit more constructive? And what we would do is like to add some age appropriate amenities to the park. One of the things the youth advisory group suggested was an outdoor ping pong table. So there are concrete and steel um, ping pong tables that can be left out in the weather. That's one example. There's a cornhole set. There are things like ladder toss. And then another thing that we've talked about is, and this has been a constant problem with scooters and skateboards, that we tell them, no, you can't be here, but we've not really given them a place that they can be that's reasonable without saying, go to the other side of you know, the city. So there are modular portable um, skate park amenities that we could put, and we've sort of looked at the um, old bridge deck and think that might be an appropriate location. You'd have eyes on the street there. And again, it's an underutilized space in the park. So this is another thing that we're going to ask for some um, reallocation of the recovery budget, I'm targeting about 25,000 to start this out. And once I get all the estimates in, I'll come back to council with a firm request and we might look at some local park funds as well. And then aside from this list, I also wanted to point out, and this goes back to Councilmember Ewing's comment about grants and likelihood, um, all of the grants that we're applying for this year, they require some sort of a local match. And that's another thing the council could do is hold back some, some funds to act as our local matches as we start getting um, more confirmation on which grants are coming in. So just some other projects, obviously the museum, the 36th bridge replacement, Main Street improvements, the 91st sidewalks, the lake outfall restoration, and then obviously um, we're always looking to purchase a new park in the, the southern part of the city. With that, um, happy to take any questions or any comments from the other directors. Oh, go ahead, Angie. It's okay, were you gonna go? Yeah, I just had a question. So thank you so much for that presentation. That was helpful. I did the matching funds. Do we know what the approximate dollar value of, assuming we got all of those grants that we applied for, what those, what the total 
in the amount of those funds are? I, I don't have a total number, but it's probably going to be, I want to say five, five to eight million dollars. And obviously those matches would come from different sets of funds, whether it's the mitigation fees, um, possibility of REIT. I know we don't have a lot of REIT left, but it would go to the mitigation or general funds. So, Okay. I'm just wondering if there's a way that we could kind of quantify how much we should um, reasonably hold back um, so that we don't get an idea of where to put these funds if we are looking at probably not having sufficient funds to meet the grant requirement of the matching fees. Yeah, we can do that. Um, staff is going to come back in a couple of weeks and have a more direct conversation on projects, and we can try to bring back uh, more detailed financials at that time. Thank you. Angie? Thanks. Really quick about Cedarwood. Am I correct in assuming that if we were to put some of our own dollars towards that project, we would um, have a better chance of leveraging that towards potential grant or state funding? Um, and again, with the, the federal grant request, we have identified that we would put local funds towards that. And that becomes a requirement of most um, grants is that you are putting your own money into it. And even if we don't get the grants, we would still need to put some funds into that facility if we want to be able to maintain it and use it in, in the future. We might just have to scale down what we want to do. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments for, uh, for Russ? Brett? Um, <clears throat> we'd just like to gauge the council's um, position on the sewer stormwater portion that was allocated. Um, is that still a priority for council? Do you want to touch that? Do you want to continue to reserve it? Um, what's your thoughts on using that money out in the sewer of Hartford? Of the remaining 3 million? Right. So we have allocated, what, two point. Five million, specifically to to be able to put sewer out into uh, the Machias area, is that still a priority? Um, do we see bigger bang for buck somewhere else? Just that will help guide the staff on reallocating this money or not reallocating it. Go ahead, Gary. Is that money in addition to the sewer district's commitment of resources out there? That's in addition to. And, and I will add that it's not necessarily allocated solely for sewer. It could be allocated for any improvements necessary. Streets, stormwater um, would really be the city sort of commitment out there. So but again, it's a placeholder because we don't have the, the project numbers yet. We won't for another six to eight months. If we're in anticipating spending uh, three million bucks, roughly, for improvement infrastructure improvements out there. What what is the um, flavor for trying to recapture some of that money when development does occur? I I, I think there's a lot of flavor for that. I think that there's also other opportunities for sourcing. Um, I, Gene, I know, talked to me about some, uh, you know, cheap utility bonding, that sort of thing. One of my concerns is, you know, we've got some opportunities here to put that money towards um, some of our recreational tourism, sports tourism ideas that would get us some immediate returns on those investments, not only within our own um, kids uh, using and, and, and adults using turfed fields, but also bringing in and attracting um, uh, sports tourism sorts of dollars uh, for an immediate return versus hanging on to this, this money and not sure what we're going to do with it down in Hartford. Um, 
but to answer your question, Gary, I think I think we could always, uh, you know, do a, um, you know, bring look to harvest some money from folks that were taking on or using the 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 resources we put in there. All right, I I would agree with those thoughts, especially in light of the major component of redeveloping Hartford is the 10 or so acres that are now occupied by a mini sewer treatment plant. And until we resolve that dilemma, uh, you know, I don't, I can't imagine there's going to be much um, appetite to, for private industry to go out there and try to redevelop Hartford. So I, I would agree with those thoughts. Uh, Kim? I would also agree with those thoughts, especially seeing as how we haven't really come up with a vision of what we want to have happen in Hartford. Uh, we've, you know, we've messed around with it for a couple of different retreats now, and we really haven't come up with a, a any kind of a vision that we can put our hat on and, and go forward. So I think that getting the bang for the buck in other areas is, is better use of that money right now. I mean, if we have a lot of uses for that money, if you, if you think about it, we just got a couple of, uh, Shannon just did a great job of telling us where we could use some money. Uh, so, you know, I'm not so sure that, uh, I mean, I like the idea of going out for more recreational things. I mean, I'm always for that, but you know, there's other things that we need to be looking at also. Uh, Marcus. Um, I think, Gary's mentioned, I've mentioned it too. I think uh, really taking a good hard look at what we went out in Hartford before we spend any money out there and get a better vision for that is, is kind of what my thought is. I would prefer that we use those funds for the more recreational stuff right now. Just, I think we have some more vision that needs to go into that Hartford area. So um, Angie or Mary, do you wanna weigh in on, the, on your thoughts with, with regard to the funds there? I concur with um, Council Councilman Tajan. I think that it's hard to justify setting aside money for something that we don't really have a plan for. I agree. Uh, Sean, did you, would you have a comment you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I I, I actually agree as well. Um, it's it's hard to the the money doesn't benefit us just sitting there. Uh, we we have investments that need to be made in our community in several areas and that's really the, the smart place to use those funds. So, you know, I think the conversation is, do we invest those, mon those monies in recreation or to council member Daughtry's point, you know, we saw a proposal where it's gonna take, you know, $1,754,000 to deal with um, our um, water retention uh, areas around the city. You know, is that where some of that money needs to be uh, diverted towards managing those things? Uh, so, I think that's the smart conversation to happen. Thank you. Um, so Brett, is there a way that we can get, um, uh, I guess, staff years and staff vision of these recreational priorities so that we can like have a look at them and have a dollar value, you know, and kind of a, kind of a, a strategy, I guess. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, and you saw it tonight, um, you know, the frontier Heights, um, uh, uh, Boy, my mind is just not working. Right. Enhancements would be part of that. The Bonneville field, uh, you know, we can only work on, we can only in, enhance what we have. So that would be Frontier Heights. It'd be Bonneville uh, field. Um, that's about it. Okay. So I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of like, okay, this is where these are at in terms of like their process. Like these are the ones that could be completed the quickest and we talk about bang for buck you know where where they're at in terms of um completion so that we can provide uh, enhance the inventory that we have for the city yeah and that'll be part of your project um presentation that we'll have for you in a, in a couple of weeks excellent thank you kim yeah, i'm all about finishing projects that we started uh you know opening up new ones is great but we haven't finished some of them like frontier heights etc so i'm I'm pretty much looking forward to, hey, you know, let's get some of these things finished. And I think to Russ's point, and I really appreciate him coming into the um, Youth Advisory Council with his presentation to them, because um, 
you know, Chief Bezizos and, and Ross, I mean, there have been issues with vandalism and um, challenges with keeping youth appropriately occupied while, you know, using those spaces. Um, and so I think, Brett, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, if that's part of your, your vision that you're seeing. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, well, that seems pretty clear direction there, I guess. <laughs> With a, of the last little uh, bit of funds there, so that we were, we we're talking about focusing that, reinvesting that more for immediate bank for a buck. So I look forward to seeing that presentation um, here, Russ, in the next uh, few weeks. Um, all right, well, Barb, is that the end of our um, your your presentation there, you and Russ? That is. Um, I just wanted to let council know this. There is no rush except, you know, on your part, if you know how you want to prioritize these. Um, there is no rush. The, the funding will stay aside until you prioritize it somewhere. And it won't change the budget at all, but it's up to you on how you want to you want to prioritize these. Thank you. All right. Um, if we have uh, Brett, any other anything else? Um, I, I don't, nothing else on the agenda unless there's something that you're itching to talk about. Um, I think, uh, I think we're good. Two and a half hour workshop is uh, more than enough, I think. You, you guys drink some talking water tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, have a great night. Thank you so much for your input. Uh, great, uh, great direction.